um, on for this demonstration, I'm going to do a still life. Um, the things you can learn for still life, the number one thing really is composition. Um, still life is not like a figure or a portrait or landscape where you look at the person and they, or the landscape and they, you just find a composition. In still life, you have to create your own composition. So for the study of composition, nothing is better than still life. And composition is what your entire painting is based on. If you don't have a good composition, then, um, you know, no matter how well you paint, it, it's sort of worthless. Okay, so the first thing I did was I made sure that my photograph and my paper were the same proportions. And then the next thing I did was I drew a little line um, about halfway, um, half an inch in from all the sides. And that's the line that if I was to frame this, that is the line where the mat would go or the frame. And so um, this way, I don't accidentally get something that I love too close to the edge. And I, I know that's a problem for me, trying to getting things too close to the edge. So um, for that reason, it really helps me to have these little lines. So the first step in my picture was, um, well, I found my photograph, but I didn't think it was composed perfectly. So I manipulated it some in Photoshop. Um, there was some other piece of lemon in the front. Um, you know, as I look at it again, do I wish I'd done some things different? Yes. And if my still life was sitting right in front of me, I would, I would probably move a few things. Uh, for one thing, the bottoms of the two lemons are lined up, the tops are kind of lined up. Um, you know, so a good plan always is to set up your composition or uh, arrange your photograph and then go away and come back because I definitely see things today that I didn't see yesterday. But uh, that being said, I'm just going to go ahead because I don't really have time at this moment to go back and change stuff. So I figured out my composition. I did the best I could for the moment in my photograph or if I had a real setup in my setup. So the next thing I'm going to do is the start of my drawing is also a composition stage. So I'm just going to see, well, where do I think things kind of go on this page? And I'm just going to sort of start, um, well, kind of scribbling. I'm not trying to finish anything. I'm just looking at the spaces between stuff. Um, I'm looking at the shadows because um, shadows, oops. Um, yeah, so try not to finish anything right now. You're just kind of trying to get things placed. So I guess another thing that was kind of hard for me to realize when I was when I'm working from a photograph is that maybe my um, my still life is going to get way over life size to make it fit on this size paper. So I did I can't remember if I said but I did crop my photograph so it would be um, this paper is 12 by 16. I cropped my photograph to be 11 by 15. So that when I came in the half an inch, it would be um, the right proportion. Um, so anyway, so I'm just going to keep going here, just sort of feeling it out, feeling out where, where is it going to be? Where does it really go? And like I said, I'm including the shadows in this, especially shadows that are cast on the table are really important because they, they become almost like objects, really. I mean, like objects, little pieces of positive shapes. And one of the main ways I use to draw is I'm not only looking at this, I'm looking at the spaces around it, which are known as the negative spaces. So you've got your positive shapes and your negative spaces, and both of those will help you to draw more accurately. At this, this drawing stage, this is something that can take me quite a bit of time. Uh, maybe not so much on landscapes that don't have buildings or on um, still lifes that, like this maybe that aren't hugely complicated, but you wanna just spend it however much time you need on your drawing. And if you sort of come to a point where you think, ah, you know, I'll just make it better when I start painting, that 
that generally speaking is a mistake because it will it will take you longer um, to make it better as you're painting it than it will be just to get it as good as you can right now. So right now I'm holding my pencil up, my charcoal up, and you can't see really what I'm doing, but I'm comparing it to my photograph. And I find that this edge and the lip of my little pitcher spout, they're lined up. They're not, um, one does not stick out over the other. So I kind of have this organized on my page now. So now I'm moving on to more of a drawing stage. I'm trying to get things a little more accurate. Um, I'm using just my fingers to wipe things off there. It's not the greatest plan, but um, I do find that it's kind of hard to um, erase on this paper. This paper is called Pastel Premier. And right now I'm drawing with a very soft piece of charcoal. And the reason why I like to do that is that um, that way I can just wipe it off. And unless you're using white paper, your charcoal will totally you know, disappear. You won't even know that it was drawn like this. Okay, so I'm doing the inside edge of this um, handle. And what I'm really looking at is this space, trying to make sure I have this space right, the space in between the negative shape. If I can get the negative shape right, that means I will have this line right, I will have this line right. So by working with negative space, I can really find the relationship between these two um, things that don't actually touch each other. Okay, so it's getting better. And you don't have to be afraid of mistakes. It's a, like a really important thing. Mistakes or whatever, I wish I had a better name for it, but um, things on the way to getting your drawing right, you just don't have to worry about it because anything you do is more accurate than an empty piece of paper. And from there, you just keep working it until um, you know, it's as accurate as you can make it. This is also a good time after I finish my drawing, this would be a good time to take a break. Um, usually I consider that a coffee and pastry break. So if you take a break now, um, after your drawing is done, when you come back, there's a much better chance that you're gonna see um, what, what you need to change. So like I was looking at this line between here and here, so this needs to come down a little bit and the top needs to come down a little bit. I try not, in a way you can see, I'm not really calling things what they are. Like, okay, yeah, this is a lemon, but I try not to, in a way, I try not to see it as a lemon. I'm just seeing it as a shape in my painting. Um, it seems to me that especially, um, well, at any time really, in a way you're painting things that don't have names. Um, so I'm not really painting a lemon, I'm painting these shapes that together turn out to be a lemon. And so you can see like right here, I've got some problems because I can't make that lemon big enough um, to go off the edge like it should. Maybe it's, maybe it's too small. This is also kind of a thing you don't, like you can paint way over life size and that's, that's like fine. Um, or you can paint under life size, but when you paint just over life size, which is what this is, then all your, your stuff looks like it was irradiated or something. Um, so just a little over life size tends to be kind of awkward because and then it looks just like you had ginormous um, lemons instance. So especially in portraiture, I believe this is true. You either want to be, if you paint too far under life size, or if you paint just under life size, your person will look like they're a kid. If you paint over life size, they'll look like they're a giant. So I think especially in portraiture, you want to either go huge or go tiny or go um, life size because just off life size is um, or just under life size is kind of problematic. So when I'm doing portraits I always actually measure the actual size of the person's face. 
So I'm just, I'm just gonna have to come in a little bit with my paper on this side. So it just would mean, luckily when you're working on paper, it just means that the mat would be a little bigger on this particular one. But if you were painting on a board or a canvas, then that's a lot more awkward to reframe something. So you wanna just try to be as sure as you can that your, your drawing is accurate. All right, so things have gotten a little messy here. Um, but at least I have all my shadows drawn in where they're going to be, um, I think. Maybe this one needs to come in just a little more. Oh, yeah, those. And this, and I kind of lost the underneath side of that. Now, it's, it's not like your drawing needs to be perfect. I mean, you want to make it as good as you can. And I never, like I was saying, I try never to just say, I'll fix it later. If I can fix it now, I try to fix it now. Anything I notice that I've done wrong, I'll try to fix it now. But there's always things that you didn't notice that were wrong and that are going to have to be fixed later. Okay, so um, let's just say this is a perfect drawing, which um, I want to acknowledge that it's not. So usually what I start with is my lightest light. So that highlight is right in here somewhere. And the reason I like to start with that high light is that um, I want to be sure I don't accidentally get some other place so light that I can't achieve my highlight. So there's also sort of a highlight right here. Highlights follow the form. So this is, as you can see from here, is coming out. So the highlight is also going to come out. And generally speaking, uh, because I'm, I'm working under an electric light, I will start my highlight a little bit yellow. White is really a cool color. It's almost like your lightest blue. So in order to make my highlight really um, look like highlight from an electric light, I need to put on a little bit of yellow. Now this highlight is going to stay a little bit more yellow. I'm starting with a little bit darker more. And so this sets the key of my painting. Um, key is a personal choice, how bright your painting is going to be overall. I like my paintings to go from the darkest dark to the lightest light. Um, that's how I like them. Okay, so next thing I'm going to do is the background. And um, Actually, I can't see it too well on, now on this, um, this recording, but the background is is pretty red. So I'm just going to start with the red. And at this point, um, you don't have to keep, you probably you want to move your, um, your clips so that you can actually go all the way to the edges with your color, because you might just, you don't want to get to this point where you're getting ready to frame it. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, I, I had this big piece of paper on the edge. And so now I'm going to have to go back and um, and fix that, like refill in where your mat didn't actually cover your paper that was painted. So the, um, that was the end of that piece. So the, the um, this is only for a composition aid. It's not to help you, you don't have to stick with it. Yes, and I could not find the exact same color I had before. Now I am working vertically, which I guess you can tell, but um, the reason I really like to work vertically is that then my pastel dust falls off. Um, I forgot today, but a really good plan is to put a little paper towel, and if it's a damp paper towel, even better, along the bottom of your tray here so it catches your pastel as it comes down. Um, also, my easel's tipping back a little bit just to make it parallel to the camera. I guess I just couldn't figure it out perfectly, but it's better if your picture tips slightly towards you and that way the pastel falls directly off. Okay, so here's my background. Um, oftentimes I, I do that order, highlight first, then the background, because the background is the largest single color in your painting, so in this case. So I usually do my background next. Now down here, this is kind of an orangey sort of brown. So I'm. I'm not going to do it next because I want to make sure that I don't get it too yellow um, so that I can't make my lemons look really yellow. I picked this still life specifically because I feel that white and yellow are two of the hardest colors to paint. 
Um, and the reason for that is that you could, um, if you were painting something that was say light blue, you could kind of just make the light side light blue and the shadow side a darker blue, but oh, surprising. I thought that was pink. <laughs> so um, yeah, so, but on lemons and white things, the color of the, of the white and shadow and the color of the yellow and shadow are just, they're really different things. You can't just make light white and dark white. You have to um, actually show the difference between white in light and white in shadow and yellow in light and yellow in shadow. So, okay, so I started with that orangey color, which honestly I thought was pink. Um, so I, I don't wanna leave that. So I'm just gonna come right back over it with pink. Sometimes, I mean, I, I do try to keep my pastels kind of organized in, uh, organized into color families, but sometimes something like that, I'll put that orange on and that's not what I wanted. Um, it's not even how I plan to start, but sometimes it kind of works out. So what I'm doing here is I'm looking at the white and I'm trying to see what other colors I see in the white and I'm continuing to kind of monitor can I make that highlight show up on a white thing? So clearly this is not a white thing yet, but there's really no point in working on it more until I have the other colors started. So this to me is kind of green. And what I'm doing is I'm just looking and I'm just saying, eh, uh, you know, it, it, maybe it looks gray, but what kind of gray is it? So I'm just gonna say it's kind of a greenish gray. And I'm just gonna do the cast shadow too. So I'm not trying to match colors. What I'm trying to do is um, think about what colors are going to be included to make the final color. So it's like if you were painting, you'd have a palette and you'd be matching or you'd be mixing things on your palette. But in pastels, I don't have a palette. This paper becomes my palette. So what I'm doing is I'm combining the colors that I think will come together to make that look white. Um, so my drawing got a little off right here. I'm not gonna worry about that right now. Um, I'm really separating my drawing and my painting uh, color from each other. And maybe it's just in here mixed. But I'm gonna come, I can always come back and redraw later. So. I, I did my best on my drawing, but now I've moved on to color and I'm no longer thinking really in terms of drawing at this moment. Okay, so I've got this and this. Um, you know, maybe maybe that's too green. Um, here's maybe a little more turquoisey green. I can try that. But like I say, there's no point in finishing these colors now because they depend on the relationships of the other colors next to them. They're not right or wrong. They are more or less correct compared on the colors that are next to them. Okay, so the lemon, lemons are hard in a way, uh, besides just being like everything is hard because I am mostly using Rembrandt pastels. Right now I'm gonna use a Winsor Newton yellow. Sadly, Winsor Newton no longer makes pastels but they had much better yellows than, um, than Rembrandt because they're kind of warm. Um, if you're just using Rembrandt's, it's like you kind of have to start with an orange to make your yellows look warm enough. So that is a straight up yellow. It's not anything weird like I did here. Um, and maybe, you know, maybe I got nervous. So I'm just gonna try to be a little weirder <laughs> and say that this is kind of my shadow color then on my lemon. And um, just get that. Okay, and same thing. I kind of lost my drawing here, but I'm not going to go back to that right yet. Um, okay, so my lemons are more alike than not. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and use that same um, hot pink for my shadow color on all my lemons. So right or wrong, there it is. And yeah, the lemons are, maybe are different from each other. Maybe, you know, maybe that one's a little lighter. This one's a little more rich yellow. 
Um, but I'm not going to worry about that. I mean, I am worried, trust me, but I'm going to deal with that later, um, making the differences. For now, um, I'm just going to start them pretty much all the same so that, um, so, so that I don't have to think any more than I'm already thinking. Now this is definitely an orange color. So I'm going to start that with something orange. So the reason I like Rembrandt pastels so much, um, I know a lot of people nowadays are using really expensive pastels. But the thing about the pastels that are more expensive is that they are also softer. So what people don't like about Rembrandt's, I guess, is that they're too hard. Uh, which just means they have more binder and less um, pigment in them. But what I dislike about the softer pastels is that um, I can't add as many layers of pastel as I want to. Um, so now I'm just putting these shadows in here. So that's why even though I have in my closet a whole box of really expensive pastels, um, I still, what I really prefer most is Rembrandt, except for some specific colors, which are just don't work well in the Rembrandt. Like when I used to paint a lot of tractors, I had a box and I still have it of just reds. And that box of reds, I, I just couldn't have done those reds um, without the expensive ones. Okay, and so here's my table. I, I know there's all these reflections and things in there, but I just want to start it simple. Um, if you think about painting as sort of juggling, it's like, it's really hard to just juggle even three things. But so here I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight colors. I'm comparing and contrasting to each other. And, and that's, that's like enough. You know, if I did a bunch more stuff right now, I would have a lot of things I was trying to compare to each other. So now my next thing is I'm going to come back to the background. And I think maybe I have it just too red. So I'm going to use some blue. And think, I just think, think is the word always. I pretty much don't spend a whole lot of time thinking. If something, if I say to myself, eh, more blue, then I just do that right away. I don't stop to analyze why does it look more blue, anything. I just try it. And because I am going to use, um, right now I'm using Blair, the brand of Blair Fixative. No, sorry. I'm using Dick Blick Fixative right now. Um, I know that when I spray this, I'm going to have a chance to do it all again. Um, so yeah, that's still not right. So I'm just going to try just literally brown on top, just see if I can get it darker. Now I don't use black hardly ever. Occasionally I do, but usually I feel like when I have to use black, it's because of a failure somewhere else that either I didn't get my lights light enough, or, um, I didn't let my pastels get rich enough, something that makes me force to, me to use black. Even when I was doing tractors, I hardly ever used black. The thing I use to darken my colors so much is the fixative. Because as soon as I don't feel like I have enough surface to add things to, so like that's the end to me back here. I've got one, two, three, four colors back here. That is the end before I have to spray that again. So then once I'm up to that kind of level on everywhere, um, I would have to take, go outside and spray it with a fixative. And the fixative does a few things for me. It, um, it sets it, so now I can add more colors to it. And the other thing it does is that it, um, it creates a new surface for me to work on, which I guess is part of it, sets it. And then um, the other thing it does is it makes the colors darker. So by using fixative, I can darken all my colors and it's almost like having an extra set of pastels. So, so far, all I've done is I've put in the lights and the darks on each object. After this, once I have these lights, so it's the same thing as drawing. 
So I'm saying, oh, that's not right. I need to put in more detail and that will help me. But what I really need to do is get the lights and darks as good as I can compared to each other. And then when those are as good as they can be, then I'm gonna go in and start adding the in-between colors that'll make this look round. So anything that is uh, round has to be described in at least three colors, the light, the dark, and the in-between color, which, um, which I'm calling the half light, but you also might hear um, artists refer to it as the half shadow. So I thought that looked a little too cold, so I just added on to warm it up a little bit. Um, it's possible I warmed it up too much compared to this. Um, yeah, so talk. I'm just going to try this, even though this is probably not right. And I'm working with the flat side of my pastel, and I'm not worrying too much about um, the way my strokes are going or anything. I'm just putting them down, and um, because I just can't think about everything at once. So now, right, I've got this way too. So I'm just going to have to come back. Um, but, you know, if you don't try, you don't know. So it's better to just keep trying things. It's better to not know what you're doing than to know what you're doing. Um, in the sense that if you don't know what you're doing, let's just keep trying stuff. If you feel like you know what you're doing, then you'll just repeat yourself. So, um, yeah. So if you look at more academic painting, um, those guys learned, I mean, they're incredible, but they learned how to do things and then they did them the same every time. Whereas the, the idea behind impressionism is that you, you don't know, you, you learn by looking. And the great thing is, honestly, it's easier to be an impressionist painter than an academic painter. And, oh, no, none of us really have time in our lives to draw, and also for most of us, it's too late. But to, you know, we weren't, we didn't grow up in a studio tradition where we spent, you know, years learning how to draw and um, years perfecting our craft. No, we just, we started whenever we started. And um, like I say, drawing, drawing is a little harder. So, um, but color is accessible to everyone just by looking and uh, seeing and being open to things that you're unexpected, like, you know, that a lemon could be green. I kind of am drawing now, I just got out of, it was so out of control. But it's, that's really a bad idea to draw with color. Like the time to draw is right after I spray this, uh, which is coming soon. Um, and then come back with your charcoal and redraw. But I just, what I want to do is I want everything to have maybe about three colors on it because when I spray it, I want it to all be at the same level because spraying knocks it back. So like sends it more back to a bit more uh, beginning stage. So if I don't, if I carry something too far, then um, when I spray it, it's gonna, you know, it's gonna all disappear anyway. So. There's no point in sort of getting ahead of myself. So I, I'm just gonna try a little more olive for me. Now I am, when I come back, I'm gonna redraw these lines because this is really bugging me that these are going off the edge um, and kind of getting expanded into shapes that aren't really right. So um, yeah, I'm gonna do that when I come back. Okay, so I'm just gonna use the same sort of olive green over here and right in here too. And then this, man, this, strangely enough, I'm finding that to be about the hardest color. And yes, I do see the reflections in it. What you always want to do when you're looking at reflections um, is squint, or if you're blessed with nearsightedness, you can pull your glasses down a little bit so you see it um, in a more abstract way. Uh, if you paint reflections with your eyes wide open, um, you'll probably make them too light. So um, reflections have to look the same on your painting as they look when you squint at your painting and your um, still life setup or photograph. Mm. 
one reason people tend to get reflections too light is because if, if a light color is surrounded by a dark color, then it will, um, you know, look lighter than it is. So by squinting at it, um, you, you see it more in relationship to how it really looks. And in a way, I might think it was a little early to be doing these things, but I have to say, I just feel like I can't figure this out unless I um, get that going, that difference between these two areas of color. I do want to keep my shadows really, my cast shadows really dark. So when you're trying to create form, you're trying to make things that look round. Um, anytime you're trying to make stuff look, yeah, round. Um, the easiest way to do it is to have a strong side light coming in and that will make the change from light to dark and that just makes it easier. So I wanted to start adding in something that I thought was gonna be kind of a half light in here. So let's start to make that turn around and so, I tried that sort of um, tan color, but I think that was too um, too yellowy. So I'm just going to try something else. And remember, you're not starting this until you feel like it's the only way you can make it better. And you know, it's it's possible I'm exaggerating, just so you know. And also, this is from a photograph, not a real setup. So. Okay, so maybe, you know, that's, I think, better. And that's really all I ask all the time. I'm asking, did I make it better or worse? Um, so, but maybe it needs something a little darker in there. So I can just go ahead and do that like now. Um, and then the same thing here. Oh, now it seems out of focus. So I kicked it, so. Right, that's a lot better. So here I kind of got that started because I felt like I kind of made a mistake right in there. So what I'm going to do is go back and um, and make the the in between color here and um, down in here, up in here. All right, so now I've got a lot of pastel on. So um, the next thing I would do is go out and spray it with fixative, then I would redraw, and then I would start the second coat. So I'm gonna stop right here for now and then come back with um, video number two. <laughs>